and welcome to Fireside Fairy Tales. If you've never been here before, <clears throat> my name's Rory, and you're watching Varietal Literature's YouTube page, which is a place where we basically just do fun things with narrative. And what we do here on Tuesday nights is we read old folklore and fairy tales. Specifically tonight, we're going to be reading some folklore from Denmark, um, <clears throat> specifically about the topic of a thing called Anissa, which is uh, a kind of house elf it's the best foothold hold i have for my audience on the concept if you've never been introduced to them before i'll talk about that in a moment but if you are watching this live then you can join us in the chat uh there's a live chat there bustling with conversation already uh that uh, discusses the story as we go along and and you can are welcome to join in share your own thoughts i check in and on it here and there as i read um if you are not watching this live, though, one benefit you have is you can skip over me talking at any point because down in the description below, there will be timestamps for the things that we're reading today. Um, and you can jump ahead to whatever interests you the most. <clears throat> I should say that uh, we are reading from the same book we read from last week, uh, which means that, uh, which is, uh, by the way, Northern uh, uh, Mythology Volume 2 by um, Benjamin Thorpe. Um, and I mention that because the way that he organizes um, his stories, I'm just turning down the music a bit, uh, the way that he organizes his stories is sort of in, in a, a long and broken way without titles. Uh, so it's a little unusual compared to our normal format where you can jump to individual stories. You will be able to jump to the beginning of sort of a series of tales on a single topics. And we're going to cover the Swedish Tomta, which is a version of the Nisa. Uh, arguably. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about um, uh, what are called church grims, uh, but only in the context of Denmark, uh, because uh, Benjamin Thorpe relates them to Nisa, and I can see his argument, so we're going to look at at least a tale of that. And then we're mostly going to look at uh, Danish Nisa, which are helpful little elves around the house in the various stories that those create. <coughs> um... So I'm just going to take a moment, say hello to the chat, do a little introduction, and we'll get right to storytelling. Um, Tammy says, NGS, both wish a happy spring. Happy spring to you. It is lovely to see the sun again. I'm looking forward to uh, picking some fresh vegetables for my cooking. A um, little bit of a discussion about the weather so far. And... I see Uncle Kitty there, I see Tammy there, I see Jump Store, I see Zombie Wolf, and I see Janera! Glad to see you, Janera. You, people were asking about you last week. We, we, uh, we've we missed you. Um, <clears throat> okay. I think I didn't miss anybody. I, I'm sorry if I did. Uh, it's good to see you folks again. Uh, I hope that uh, spring has been treating you well for the day that it's been around. I believe today's the first day of spring. Somebody correct me if I'm wrong on that. Um, anyways, that's enough chitty chat for me. Let's talk a little bit about these Danish house elves, which is not really their name at all. Um, so I'll do a little introduction here, but actually I'm going to let um, the author of this do their own introduction. Um, not in person, they're long dead, but um, I'm going to let Benjamin Thorpe introduction of the Nisa be carry most of the weight here. I just want to connect it to this concept of the house elf and some topics that we've talked about before. So the simple question is what is the connection between the modern fantasy house elf and folklore? And of course plenty connects it because uh, if, and if you don't know uh, house elves is a concept in Harry Potter um, or at least that comes up in Harry Potter. Uh, their house elves are based on old the old folklore trope of a house spirit or a fae type creature who in some way serves the household. However, I really only reference house elves to be completely transparent um, because it gives you as a viewer in a modern time a bit of a foothold on the concept that we're talking about. Thematically and conceptually, there really isn't a lot in common between uh, Harry Potter's house elves and the various forms of house elf that it's referencing. Uh, it definitely comes from it, but it, it does its own things with it. Uh, so, my mouse is being a little strange here. Um, 
so the concept of a house helpful house spirit uh, is a thing that you will find all over the world. I think for obvious reasons in folklore. We've covered this concept before. Uh, if, if you're curious, the concept of that that Harry Potter seems to most pull from is the is basically the British or the English concept of kind of goblins in the house. They have lots of different variants of goblins, but there are ones that behave somewhat like you see in uh, Harry Potter. But that aside, uh, there are concepts of helpful house spirits in Celtic, Germanic, and Scandinavian folklore. A lot more than that, but those are the ones I know best. Uh, in fact, we previously did an episode on the German conception of a kobold, which I will remind you is very different than the English conception of a kobold, which is what D&D pulls from, where they're little scaly creatures underground, although I don't think they're scaly in the English folklore either, but they are sort of from mines. In German folklore, they're a lot more like house elves. They're a lot more like Nisa, what we're going to look at today, <coughs> um, which is a Scandinavian concept. It comes up at least, according to you know Benjamin Thorpe here, and probably further on, in Denmark, in Sweden, and in Norway to some extent. Um, <clears throat> I couldn't find any reference of whether it's a, a Finnish concept as well, but I wouldn't be surprised. Um, I didn't know of any in Icelandic, but I'm open to correction and reference there. Uh, now, as far as what Anissa is, I'm, he gives a description that I'm going to get to, but I just for your reference, they look quite a bit like a garden gnome in our concept. They have little red hats. They're short. They're sort of dwarfish. They're similar to the barrow folk we were talking about last week in their form, but their actual activities uh, are quite different. Um, they are known for helping mostly around barns and farms, as we'll see. And uh, importantly, they do this by their own volition, which is separates them a bit, is at least separates them from the modern conception of the house elf. Uh, but in some cases, it also separates them from the German kobold, which sometimes is bound to service and sometimes is not. <clears throat> so that's what we're dealing with. Basically, little gnomes. Uh, they're not gnomes in any strict sense. I'm just referencing that because visually they have a lot of uh, resemblance to gnomes as we understand them now, garden gnomes. Um, little gnomes that uh, help around farms and barns. That's basically what the Nisa is. In a more detailed way, I'm going to move on to how Benjamin Thorpe describes them, and then I'm going to give you some of the stories that Benjamin Thorpe has collected around these funny little things. And as I'm going through it, I am curious, chat, what would you trade to get a little helper spirit around the house? <coughs> Which isn't really how it works for the Scandinavian concept, but that is how the kobolds tend to work in Germany. What would you trade? What would you offer? to get someone to help you fold laundry and stuff. Okay. So our first passage isn't necessarily a story. It's an introduction by Benjamin Thorpe in the book that we're going to pull our stories from. Um, on the Nisa or the Nice. Uh, and I read from that now. This is a supernatural being, nearly resembling our goblin, the Scottish brownie, something I've never covered, the German kobold, or the kabouter mannequin of the Netherlands. <clears throat> in the good old times, they were infinitely more numerous than they are in our days. They are not larger than small children, are clothed in grey, and wear a red pointed cap. Their habitation is usually in barns and stables, where they help to tend the cattle and horses, for which they show some partiality as for men. There are many instances of the Nisa having drawn the hay from the cribs of other horses to that of the one for which he entertains a predilection, and we will see some stories to that effect. He is fond of pranks, will sometimes let all the cows loose in the cowhouse, plague the milkmaids, either by blowing out the light or by holding the hay so fast the poor girls cannot draw out a particle. Then, while they are talking with all their might, he will suddenly let go of his hold so that they fall at full length on the ground. This delights the Nisa exceedingly and causes him to set up a horse laugh, which is a turn of phrase he uses twice in this book. It's very confusing. I, horse laugh just means like laughing sort of in a sound that's reminiscent of a horse, but I don't know why he says set up. I've never heard of anybody use that turn of phrase for laughter. It just means they laugh. Um, 
If he feels attached to the master of the house, he will do all he can for his benefit. Instances, indeed, are not wanting of his having endeavored to abstract hay and other things from his neighbors for the use of his master. Whence contention and conflicts sometimes take place between the Nisa of the two houses so that the hay and straw may be seen flying about in all directions. Unfortunately, I couldn't find a story to that effect, though it sounded fun. As they are obliging to those they favor, but spiteful and vindictive when anyone slights or makes game of them, it is not surprising that their goodwill is deemed worth the gaining. On Christmas Eve, and I should say in modern times, the Nisa is quite heavily associated with Christmas. It's a little less directly associated in the past, and you'll see that. On Christmas Eve, therefore, and on Thursday evenings, in many places, they set sweet porridge, cakes, beers, etc. for the Nisa, which he gladly consumes, provided they are to his taste, for he is sometimes dainty. <clears throat> Ridicule and contempt he cannot endure, and as he is strong, notwithstanding his diminutive size, his opponent often comes off second best. A peasant who one winter evening met Anissa on the road and in an authoritative tone ordered him to get out of the way found himself, before he knew a word of the matter, pitched over the hedge into a field of snow. With a girl also who one Christmas Eve brought him food accompanied with mockery, he danced such a dance that she was found on the following morning lying dead in the barn. They love the moonlight, and in winter they may sometimes be seen amusing themselves in little sledges or in leaping over the fences. Although they are lively, yet they do not at all times like noise and bustle, particularly on Christmas Eve or a Thursday evening. In general, the Nisa is liked and is therefore in many places called Good Fellow. And briefly... <clears throat> oh no, there's a little more here. Sorry. Just realized that. Uh, of all the beings that live in the imagination of the Norwegian peasantry, the Nisa is that of whose existence they are the most thoroughly convinced. This is written by Benjamin Thorpe, who I think is, was, this very old book. Uh, I think he was English. So when he speaks from, I think at least this is for an English audience. So when he speaks from the perspective of us, that's probably who he's referencing. Um, <clears throat> though belonging to the dwarf race, we have no idea. There's no such, like, taxonomy in folklore. I don't know where he gets that from. They are perhaps of the Barrow folk, whatever that means. <clears throat> he nevertheless differs from the dwarfs by his sprightliness and well-proportioned figure, as well as by his sojourn in houses and barns for which his predilection is so strong that he cannot endure a removal. For he will then forsake the family and take their good luck with him, it is this partiality to old Tofts that has obtained for him the names of Toftvete, Tomtavete, or Gadpo. <clears throat> Tomta is what we'll see in the Swedish version of him. Neither in the Eddas nor the sagas and that if you don't know the poetic era and and the sagas is a reference to where we get all our information about <coughs> um the norse gods and norse mythology um i don't think there are other sources but then those two other than sort of scraps here and there because it was a mostly um, um i kind of think of the word oral culture it was mostly orally transmitted <clears throat> uh is there any mention of the nisa akin to him are the niagarasa <clears throat> of the faroe islands who are described as diminutive with red caps and bringers of luck and the swedish tanta guva they frequently dwell in the high trees that are planted around the house, which, on which account care should be taken not to fell them, particularly the more ancient ones. And I may fit in a tale about a, a sort of tree spirit related to that. Many a one has paid for his disregard herein by an incurable disease. So, the Nisa are like helpful little spirits, pretty vague. Um, their form of a little red cap and stuff doesn't come up too much in the stories that we'll see, but... I have no reason to doubt that that is probably a common portrayal. 
Um, <clears throat> if I scroll down just a bit here. I'll just use the page. We can get to our tales, our first of our tales. Okay. Uncle Kitty says he would offer food. Everyone loves food. Indeed, many um, will see the Nisa has a particular taste for food. Or I should say a particular type of food it has a taste for. The um, There are ways to trick them in German, uh, the German kobold. I don't know of one for the Nisa. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to actually start us off with a, a brief uh, accounts of the Tanta, which is the Swedish niece, um, because it comes in this order in the book. And we're going to spend most of our time on um, the Danish Nisa. Uh, and there are distinctions between them and uh, I don't know, they're tales nonetheless. So let's go to a farm, which means... Just setting up some sound here. So our first proper tale of the night comes to us from Northern mythology, a um, collection of folklore about Scandinavia mostly, from Benjamin Thorpe, a turn of the century collector and translator. Uh, and this work you can find almost anywhere for free. But um, our first tales concern the Tomta, or the Swedish variant of the Nice. Two husbandmen dwelt in a village. They had like <clears throat> arable land, like meadow, like wood and pasture, but one grew richer and the other poorer from year to year. The one had a house painted red, well tarred and boarded walls, and a sound turf roof. The other's habitation was moss clad with bare rotten walls and a leaky roof. Whence all this difference, many a one will answer. The rich man had a tomta in his house. He appears before the master, and if she is kind to him, before the mistress also. But what are they like, these propitious little things? In magnitude like a child of a twelve-month-old, but with an ancient, sagacious-looking face under a little red cap, with a grey, coarse, woolen jacket, short breeches, and shoes like those worn by peasant children. He appears at noontide, in summer and autumn, and has generally a straw or an ear of corn, which he drags slowly along, panting at every step, like one under the heaviest burden. On such occasion, the poor peasant had once laughed at Atonta and said, What difference is there whether thou bringest me that or nothing? Well, this vexed the little weary collector, and he transferred himself to the other peasant's abode, who was at the time a poor new beginner. And from that day, prosperity withdrew itself from him who had despised the diminutive being being. But the other man, 
who esteemed the industrious little Tomta and took care of the smallest straw or ear became rich, and cleanliness, order, and abundance reigned in his dwelling. They are easily offended little things, aren't they? Carrying on. If a stable man takes care of his horses, speaks kindly to them, feeds them at 10 o'clock at night, and again at 4 in the morning, he has no cause to stand in fear of the Tanta. But the careless one who maltreats the cattle, curses and swears when he enters the stable, forgets their nightly food and sleeps till day, must take good care of himself lest when he steps into the stable he get a buffet on the ear from the unseen but hard fist of the Tomta that brings him to a stand on his nose. It has been believed that the souls of those in who in heathen times were slaves, and while the master and his sons were engaged in piracy, had charge of the land and buildings, and were employed in our agriculture, are represented in these small grey beings as pursuing their former earthly labors until doomsday. It's bleak. <clears throat> there are still many... Christians who believe in these taunt spirits and annually make them a kind of offering, or as they now term it, give them a reward. This takes place on the day when joy was proclaimed to all the world and salvation, even to the Tomtar, Christmas morning. And Kisnis, in some small pieces, of course, <clears throat> gray woolen cloth, a little tobacco, and a shovel full of earth. Tomtar are also called Nisar. For the good Nice, the country folks <clears throat> in Bleak King and other places are wont to say, when out at work in the fields and sitting at their repast, they lay a piece of bread, cheese, etc., under a green turf whereby they hope to gain his goodwill. A peasant in Scania was in the habit of placing food on the stove daily for the Tomptar of the Nisa. These came to the knowledge of the priest where, and who thereupon searched the house for the sake of convincing its inmates that no Nisa was to be found. How then does the food disappear every night? asked the peasant. That I can tell you, Satan takes it all and collects it in a kettle in hell, in which kettle he boils to boil your souls for all eternity. From that time, no more food was set out. For the Nisa, where building and carpenter's work are going forward, where building and carpenter's work are going forward, it is said that the Tomta, while the workmen are at their dinner, may be seen going about and working with small axes. And when a tree is felled in the forest, it is said, the woodman holds the axe, but the Tomta fells the tree. And when the horses in a stable are well tended and in fine condition, it is said the groom lays the food in the crib, but it is the Tanta who makes the horse fat. Gia says the priest blew it for the poor Tanta. True. A housewife, when she sifted meal, had long remarked that there was an uncommon weight in the tub, and that although she had frequently taken considerable con quantities from it, the weight exceeded all belief. But once, when going to the storeroom, she chanced to look through the keyhole, through a chink in the door, and beheld a little tomta in tattered grey clothes, sitting and busily sifting in the meal tub. Well, the woman withdrew softly. It made a new handsome kirtle for the industrious little fellow, hung it on the edge of the tub, and at the same time placing herself so that she might see what he thought of his new garment. When he came, he immediately put it on and began to sift most sedulously, which is the first time I've ever heard that word, by the way. But seeing that the meal dusted and not, I should say, this story, I've read this story before. When I first read this story, it was the first time I encountered it. But seeing that the meal dusted and damaged his new cartel, he exclaimed, casting the sieve from him, The young spark is fine, he dusts himself, never more will he sift. 
and so she lost herself a helper. Okay. So we get a concept of the Swedish Tumta there. Now I'm going to read you a section that is in many ways unrelated to our topic, but I'm setting it up because the Danish Nisa by, um, I should say, Benjamin Thorpe's account is related to their church grims. Um, and I just wanted to show that that wasn't a universal thing in um, Scandinavian folklore, that church grims were like that. Uh, so instead, where the first story you're going to hear about a church grim here is the um, Swedish church grim, which is called a church lamb. And uh, keep it in your mind. I'm just going to read it. Keep it in your mind. And when we get to the church grim at the end of our next section, um, you'll see what a contrast it is. <clears throat> this tale also comes to us from Benjamin Thorpe's collection, Northern Mythology, Volume 2. It is about a church grim that does not resemble Anissa, but it will set a contrast to one that does from Danish lore later. The church grim and the church lamb. Heathen superstition did not fail to show itself in the construction of Christian churches. In laying the foundation, the people would retain something of their former religion and sacrifice to their old deities whom they could not forget, some animal which they buried alive, either under the foundation or without the wall. The specter of this animal is said to wander about the churchyard by night and is called the Kyukrim, or, <coughs> sorry, let me say that again, the Kyukrim, or Churchgrim. A tradition has also been preserved that under the altar in the first Christian churches, a lamb was usually buried which imparted security and duration to the edifice. This is an emblem of the genuine church lamb, savior of the world, who is the sacred cornerstone of his church and congregation. Of course, they're speaking of Jesus there. When anyone enters a church at a time when there is no service, he may chance to see a little lamb spring across the choir and vanish. That is the church lamb. When it appears to a person in the churchyard, particularly to the grave diggers, it is said to forebode the death of a child that shall be next laid in the earth. GS says, because she got flour on a gift she gave him? What? I got the impression that he just was like, if I'm going to get a nice shirt for nothing, why should I keep working? But others might have an interpretation. Okay, <clears throat> so now we have the Swedish Tomta, which is going to be related quite heavily to the Danish Nisa, but we're going to see a lot of differences too. But also we get this church grim that is about a lamb sacrificed for churches and sometimes you see them and it forebodes grim things and it doesn't really seem to do much other than that, other than just sort of show up and be an icon of something. Uh, so we're going to see quite a contrast in how the Danish assemble church grooms and how the Danish um, deal with the Nisa or the Nice. So this is sort of the core uh, st set of stories we're going to read today. Uh, again, it's a series of tales about the little Danish house elf, if you want to think of it that way. So this collection of tales concerns the Danish Nisa, or Nice. And it comes to us again from Northern Mythology, uh, a collection by Benjamin Thorpe. This is the second volume of it, and you can get it for free online. In a house in Jutland, a Nisa had long been accustomed after the servant was gone to bed to fetch his porridge from the kitchen, where it was set for him in a little wooden bowl. But one evening, on taking his porridge, he saw that the girl had forgotten to put butter in it. And in his anger at the omission, he went to the cow house and wrung the neck of the best cow. Afterwards, feeling hungry, he sneaked back, deeming it advisable to put up with the despised porridge, 
when after he had eaten a little he discovered there was butter in it, but that it had sunk to the bottom. For having thus wronged the servant's servant, he was sorely grieved, and to repair the injury he had done to the good folks, he went again to the cow house and placed a chest full of money by the side of the dead cow. That's that's unique for the Fae to feel regret. At a farm in Seelan, there was Anissa, who was active and cheerful at all kinds of work, provided only that he got butter in his porridge every night. For any reward beyond that, he did not require. I will note, porridge isn't necessarily oats here. They made porridge out of all sorts of grains. One morning, as the men were going to plow, he went to the farmer and requested him to let him drive the plow. The man thought that he was too little to drive four horses, but he answered, I can very well sit up in the ear of one of the horses and drive with four. I've done it before now. The man then let him have his way, and afterwards he could not help confessing that he had never before had so excellent a driver. It was, moreover, highly amusing when anyone passed and could not see the driver who sat in the horse's ear, but only heard him crying out, so, hop so, will you go, you old jades? You'll get your hides curried that you may swear to. When the farmer died, the Nisa was no longer, would no longer remain there, but transferred himself to the manor house, where he continued for some time in concealment. Some days after, the proprietor got a new man, who was to thrash the winter corn. The first day when the man came into the barn, he did nothing but merely looked at the corn. On the second day, he did no more than the first until <clears throat> um, niece, I guess is what I, the Nisa towards evening said to him, here, I'll come and help thee. To this, the man had nothing to object. So it was settled that niece should every night have for his supper porridge with butter in it. On the following morning, when the man came into the barn, he had already thrashed a heap of corn, containing about twenty-five loads. Thou canst now cut up the straw by noon, said Ni, and as he helped, so it was done. Then said the man, but how shall we get the chaff separated from the barley? That I will soon show ye thee, said Ni. Just go up outside on the top of the barn and make a large hole in the roof. We shall then easily separate the chaff. And when the man had done so, then he opened every door in the barn, then went up to the hole, laid himself on his face, and thrust his head through the hole, and sent forth the loud scream, the loudest scream you've ever heard, so that all the chaff flew about the whole yard. And this brought the proprietor out, who on seeing what had been done was highly incensed. I believe thou art mad, fellow, said he. Dost thou let the chaff that we should have for cattle in the winter fly away in that manner? Oh, is that all, master, said the man. If you want the chaff in again, then that you can soon have. And the Nisa now helped the man to gather up the chaff and carry it in again, all which was accomplished in about a half an hour. Go now to your master, said the Nisa, and tell him that the corn is thrashed, the chaff gathered in a heap. If he will come out and measure, that we may know how many bushels there are. But tell him at the same time that we must be paid for every bushel of chaff as well as every bushel of corn. And then if he refuses, we will throw down the whole barn. And when the man had delivered this message, the mas master answered laughing. Yes, do so if you can. But I'm not so silly as to pay the same for chaff as for corn. When the Nisa received this answer, he merely said, Well, if he will not then come, we shall soon overthrow it. But then went, both then went and placed their backs against one of the side walls. And when it instantly began to totter, seeing this, the proprietor ran out into the yard and yielded to the demand so that the man got well paid for his trouble and did not forgive, forget to give his due recompense to the Nisa.
it is difficult to get rid of Anissa. A man dwelt in a house where Anissa carried his jokes so far that he resolved to quit it and leave the Nisa by himself. Just as he was about to send off the last load of his chattels, consisting chiefly of empty tubs and the like, and had taken a last farewell of the house, and as he thought of the Nisa also, he went by chance to the back part of the cart, where to his unutterable dismay and astonishment he espied the Nisa seated in a tub and ready to accompany him. The man was, of course, excessively vexed at finding all his labor in vain, but the Nisa burst into a hearty laugh and popped up his head from the tub and said, So, <laughs> are we moving today? <clears throat> um, it goes on to mention that there is uh, the... Uh, This story relates to the Boggart in uh, English lore or Yorkshire lore. And um, uh, the Irish, and I'm sure I'm saying this wrong, it's very hard to find Irish pronunciation guides um, that deal with old words. But uh, Clericon. Um, anyways, I, I won't read it out here, but it does note that there is a lot of similarity in this tale to an uh, English and an Irish tale. Carrying on. <clears throat> in the parish of Elstrop, there once lived a man who had a beautiful white mare, which for many years had descended from father to son and was the cause that Anissa and consequently good luck were attached to the farm. This Nisa had such an affection for the mare that he could not endure to see her used for labor, and every night fed her in the best manner. And as he was accustomed to bring a superabundance of corn, both thrashed and unthrashed, from a neighbor's barn, all the other cattle had benefit thereof. But the farm, at length, got a new proprietor, who would not believe what was told him about the mare so, and sold her to a poor neighbor. When five days had elapsed, the poor peasant who had bought the mare began to find his condition manifestly improving, while the other circumstances became every day narrower, so that at length he could scarcely make shift to subsist. Had now the man that brought the mare only known how to profit by the good fortune that was come to him as children's children would have been in affluence to this day, but... Seeing the great quantity of corn that was every night brought in, he felt a strong desire to see the Nisa also, and therefore concealed himself one night in the stable. At midnight, he perceived the Nisa coming from his neighbor's barn and bringing with him a sack full of grain, but the Nisa, having discovered that he was watched, was grievously vexed. And after having fed the mare, tended her for the last time, then turning towards the place where the man lay watching, he bade him farewell. From that time, the condition of both neighbors continued alike, seeing that each enjoyed the fruits of only his own labor. Uncle Kitty says, I just blue screened. Let me know if anybody else did. It says it's still sending. Had a pretty good bit, bit rate. <clears throat> Oof. Uh, I see, uh, nope, fine, okay, carrying on then. <clears throat> Yetlin once literally swarmed with Nisa. At Vasburg, there they found such good cheer that they their abode there was characterized by their great diligence and care for the welfare of the proprietor. Every evening they got in their sweet porridge, a large lump of butter for all which they gave a strong proof of zeal and gratitude. In a very severe winter, a remote cow house in which there were six calves was so overwhelmed with snow that for 14 days, no human being could get access to it. 
When the snow disappeared, it was naturally thought that the calves would be found starved to death, but quite the contrary. They were all found strong and well. The stalls were swept and the cribs were full of excellent corn. It may easily be guessed who had taken care of them. But the Nisa is, at the same time, sure to have revenge for any injury done him. One day when Anissa had run up to, into the loft over the cowhouse, a plank gave way so that one of his legs went through. Well, the farmer's boy, being as he is, who happened just at that moment when this happened to be in the place beneath, on seeing the niece's little leg hanging down, snatched up a dung fork and gave it a violent blow. At dinner... When the people were all sitting at table in servants' hall, the boy was constantly laughing to himself, and on being questioned by the overseer, he answered, I've had such a bout with Nice this morning, and given him an infernal bang with my fork. He poked his leg down through the floor of the loft. Nay, cried Nice from outside the window. Thou didst not give one, thou gavest me th Three, for the fork had three prongs, but it shall be paid thee back. On the following night, while the boy lay asleep, came Nice, seized him, and threw him over the house, but was so instantaneously on the other side that he caught him again and cast him back, and the game was continued until the boy had been eight times tossed over the house the ninth time he let him fall into a large pool of water and then the nisa set up a horse laugh or gave a laugh basically <laughs> so that all who were in the dwelling were waked by it in other words awoken by it in a farmhouse in Yutland, there was a Nisa who every evening got his porridge in proper time and therefore helped both man and maid and saw to the master's interest in every way possible. But there once entered into the farmer's service a mischievous lad who took every opportunity of annoying the Nisa. And one night when all were gone to rest and the Nisa had taken his little wooden bowl and was about to enjoy his evening meal, he discovered that the boy had concealed the butter at the bottom in order to make him first eat the porridge and then find the butter when the porridge was consumed. Thereupon he resolved on giving the boy like for like, going then up into the loft where the boy and the manservant lay sleeping in the same bed. He took the cover lid off, and when seeing the short lad by the side of the long carl, he said, Short and long unequal. And so saying, pulled the legs of the boy down to make them evening even with those of the man. He then went to the head of the bed and dragged the boy up again, uttering the same words, short and long unequal. But as this process in whichever way applied did not succeed in making the boy as long as the man, he continued dragging the boy up and down until broad daylight. When feeling himself tired, he crept up and seated himself in the window sill. At the sight of him, all the dogs in the yard, dogs bearing a great aversion to Nisa, began to bark, at which the Nisa, who was well beyond their reach, was highly amused, and thrusting forth first one diminutive leg and then the other, continued to tease them, saying, Look at this little trotter, and look at that little trotter. In the meantime, this the boy woke, <clears throat> and sneaking behind that Nisa, who was going on with this, Look at this, and look at that little trotter, pushed the Nisa down among the dogs, crying out, There! Now look at him from top to toe! Um, I'll repeat what I normally say, which is, I don't think there is really a moral to that story. That's <laughs> with so much folklore. GS says, so much porridge with butter in it. Not sure I want to try it. Cream, yeah. I imagine that country butter is probably uh, closer to cream than, than our modern, fairly cleanly done butter. Apparently Uncle Kitty is having um, issues. 
Sorry to hear that, Uncle Kitty. That's a very stressful thing. I certainly relate out here on my crappy little laptop. <coughs> now we move on to uh, the Kierkegrim in uh, Danish uh, folklore, which uh, here Benjamin Thorpe relates. We're only going to read one story of the Kierkegrim. Um, relates to the Nisa, and I do think that he makes a fair point here. There's obviously some relationship to how the Danish regard it, but contrast it to that lamb we talked about earlier, which was Swedish. And notice how, you know, how even within the same family of Scandinavian folklore, you get so much variation. In ch churches also there are Nisa, one in each, called a Kirkgrim who dwells either in the tower or wherever he can find a place of concealment. He keeps order in the church and punishes when any scandal is perpetrated. In Sorrow Church, there is a large round hole in the roof in which dwells that church's Nisa. Of this hole, it is also said that in former times, the evil one was accustomed to fly out through it when the priest baptizing said, Go out, thou unclean spirit! The Kierkegrim and the Strand Vassal. At the time when the seahorses were not yet consecrated, it was dangerous to pass by night on the ways which lay along the coast on account of the Strand Vassal, by which they were infested. Now, exactly what these are, these Strand Vassal. I'm not too sure I couldn't find much about them. But they sound a lot like the German spirits I mentioned before that clamp onto your back and ride you. There was a show I did on that. These were the specters of the corpses that were driven on shore and still lay unburied. One night as a peasant was going along the strand towards Tarbeck, a strand fossil sprang suddenly on his back and there clung fast, crying, Carry me to the church. The man, having no alternative, carried him the shortest way to <clears throat> Gintofte. On their reaching that village and when close under the churchyard wall, the Varsal sprang quickly over it when instantly the Kirkgrim approached and an obstinate battle ensued between them. After having fought for a while, they both sat down to rest and when the Vassal said to the peasant, Did I stand up well? The peasant answered, No. The battle then commenced anew and when they again sat down to rest, the Vassal again asked, did I stand up well now? The peasant a second time answered, No. The fight then recommenced. And the vassal for the third time said, Now, have I stood up well? And on the peasant answering, Yes, it is well for thee, said the vassal that thou hast answered so, for otherwise I would have surely broken thy neck. Uh, Gia says, I love the seashore. Don't want to have to worry about the church grim. Well, in this case, the church grim would save you. The problem is these sort of... They actually kind of remind me... Uh, their tail and stuff reminds me a lot of um, Drog. <clears throat> At Niharu, uh, as a woman was going to milk her cows, she saw a corpse that had been washed up on the sand and noticed that a large money bag was bound round its body. And no one being near, she was tempted to take the money, to which she had as good as claim as anyone else. But the next night, the Strandvassel came to the village and made a great noise before her window, desiring her to come out and follow him, supposing that she had no alternative. She bade her children farewell and accompanied the Vassal. When they were outside the village, the Vassal said to her, Take me by the leg and draw me to the church. But the nearest church lay three quarters of a mile distance. And when the church appeared in sight, the vassal said, Let me go now, then go to the house by the church gate and desire the people 
to sit up until thou comest again. And when thou hast helped me over the churchyard wall, run as fast as thou canst, lest the Kirkagrim should seize thee. Well, she did accordingly. And scarcely had the corpse been placed over the wall when the Kirkagrim came out after the woman and seized her by the petticoat, which being old gave way, and so she slipped into the house in safety. From that time all went well with the woman, who lived contented with her children on the money she found on the strand vassal. And if people aren't putting it together, my understanding is basically they want to be buried. So they cling on to people and get them to be dragged there and for one reason or another the church grim doesn't want them buried there I guess now this last story I don't know where I'll ever fit it in and I guess you could argue it has some relationship to the idea of little guardian spirits of sorts which you know we start with a house spirit that's helpful and cares for horses and cows and stuff and then you kind of see it become a little bit different, a little more protective over the church for unclear reasons. And so this one is just a short story about one that sort of does it for old trees. And it was such a cool concept in a short story, I'm tagging it on the end here. Um, <clears throat> the Hillmore Elder. There dwells in the elder tree a being, call, a being called the Hildemore Elder, or the Elder Mother, or the Hildevink, uh, the Elder Wife. Which, if you're a Tolkien fan, should sound familiar. Um, <clears throat> she avenges all injuries done to the tree. Of an elder standing in a small court by the knee border. She, it is related, uh, which is apparently a quarter of Copenhagen. Built for an inhabited by persons belonging to the navy. It is related that at dusk it often moves up and down the court. And sometimes peeps through the window at the children when they are alone. It is not advisable to have movables of elder. A child having been laid in a cradle made of elder wood, the Hildemore came and pulled it by the legs, nor would she let it have any rest until it was taken out of the cradle. A peasant once heard his children crying in the night and on inquiring the cause was told that someone had been there and sucked them and their breasts were found to be swollen, which is the most disturbing thing I've never heard before. Bravo, Denmark. <laughs> the cause of the annoyance was, it is said, that, that the room was boarded with elder. This wonderful medicinal tree derives its name, it is supposed, from a healing deity named Hildi, who, together with their, her spirits and subordinate deities, has her abode under its roots. From early times, the Danes have loved and honored the elder and planted it by walls and fences. The elder may not be cut without permission previously asked in these words, Hildemor, Hildemor, allow me to cut thy branches. The peasants there went about to cut the spirit, spit thrice in order to drive away the Veta and other evil beings. So, I mean... It's got the leg dragging people back and forth in their bed to wake them up and so on. I guess it's loosely based. I mean, it, the, this, this stuff is all very thin on the borders between the different spirit conceptions of folklore. So, what have we talked about here? Uh, well, we talked about Danish elves that care for stuff. In this case, I called them house elves. You see, they don't really go in the house. Um, they seem to tend to the barns and like barn animals and... A lot of the way that they help you is they go and steal stuff for you, which is a mixed bag. And it's interesting that there's no stories where there's confusion about that. Uh, I find that um, is what I expected to happen. Maybe at some point I'll write my own story to that effect about a man who is being framed by Anissa. Um, <clears throat> but uh, as was noted in the beginning by Benjamin Thorpe, um, the Anissa is certainly not the only spirit that behaves this way in folklore um you know there's the german kobold and then there's a bunch of other ones that we haven't really read about that if i can find adequate sources that i trust and that are interesting i, I will read you about them too um 
Uh, Jumpstore says, I always found it interesting how people in fairy tales had to ask permission to do so much as cut wood, just like cheese. Do I need permission to use the latrine too? <laughs> probably somewhere. Um, you know, it, it, it probably just comes down to, because look at where it gets applied, right? Like something terrible happens to your children and you don't know why. Somebody comes along and says, well, it's because you built your house out of elderwood. You know, it gives you some sense of control over the chaos of the world. Jess says, I'd love your version, Rory. I'd love it too, but I have so many things that I'm writing. I need to just start finishing stuff. Um, all right. I... Uh, The, um, what I will say is, um, if you are, um, if you are trying to nail down your own Nisa, if you choose to believe, uh, unironically in it, uh, then by most accounts in the Swedish and, um, Danish accounts here, it seems that you need to put some butter on some porridge out at night and maybe some beer and a little bit of rough gray cloth. Though I think you can't just buy it from the store. I think you kind of have to weave it yourself. Usually that was flax, and weaving flax is very hard. But you could try it. Who knows? Maybe you won't have to fold laundry anymore. Although I think the Nisa probably would mostly be taking care of, like, I don't know, what's the modern equivalent of cattle other than just people who have cattle? Cats? Feed my cat? Speaking of feeding my cat, I should probably wrap up. Um, Zombie Wolf says, uh, random trivia, scientists have discovered that rats giggle when their tummies are tickled. I love rats. Unironically, not because I'm trying to be like an edgelord or something like that. If you've ever spent time with a rat, they are as interesting and as affectionate as any dog I've ever had. And I love dogs. I grew up with like a half dozen dogs in my house. Uh, and have had cats and have had guinea pigs which i would also say but i think rats are tremendously interesting affectionate creatures um <clears throat> apparently on youtube you can hear pitched down versions of the giggling which they can't hear i love that trivia zombie wolf thank you tammy says so well good night all thank you again for a wonderful stream again happy spring and see everyone thursday and i couldn't have said it better myself um jum store tammy Zombie Wolf, briefly there, Gennaro, it was good to see you again. GS, if you're out there, witchery, witchery as well. And Uncle Kitty, I hope that your uh, computer gets fixed. Um, you know, at least this is all on demand, so until it does, you will be able to, you'll be able to go back and watch it. Um, thank you everybody for watching, and uh, <clears throat> hey, you know what? Maybe try some porridge. Although, to be honest, their porridge is probably barley, as I understand it. Barley was a lot more common as a kind of, like, peasant food. And it doesn't make a great porridge. <laughs> but um, maybe try a barley porridge with butter, and maybe you'll find it's delicious. I don't think so, but maybe. I think it's probably more delicious if you spend several hours doing backbreaking labor and not eating anything else. Because anything's delicious after that. Anyhow. I'll keep the fire warm. You have a good sleep. Thank you.